So John chapter 17 in your Bibles, we're going to look at the very last verse. We've been going actually literally one verse at a time uh, in the last three weeks to unpack what God has for us this morning. I'm going to read the verse to you and then we'll jump in. It says this in John chapter 17 and verse number 26. I have made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. You know, I think this is true about all of us in our lives that we all have things in our lives that demand our attention. There are things in our lives, situation, people in our lives that literally demand our attention. That becomes the priority in our life. That person, that situation that we're going through, it, it literally consumes our minds and hearts and demands that we pay attention to it. But oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes, sometimes the thing that demands our focus and attention is not always the highest priority in our lives. It's just the one that has the most emergency. And oftentimes, as humans, we can get caught up focusing on something that really doesn't matter. It just matters right now. And it takes our focus. As human beings, sometimes our focus and our attention can be stolen because of distractions. I don't know about you, but there are times where I'll be sitting up in my office and I'll be studying or I'll be, uh, you know, working hard on a project and, and, I've, and I find myself pushing away from the desk, grabbing my phone and checking Instagram to make sure everybody's cat is doing just fine, right? I don't know why that is. I'm deep in focus and I'm working and all of a sudden I feel like the urge to pick up my phone and just check to make sure how everybody's lunch was and make sure how everybody's shoes are, are doing and make sure that I know what's going on. And once I feel it's all safe in the world, I put my phone down, I go back to work, right? Because I feel better. And oftentimes in our lives, we can have things that demand our attention. We can have things that steal our attention. And oftentimes those things are not the priority in our lives. But here's the beauty of this passage and the end of this prayer in John 17 is that Christ gives his disciples their priority and their purpose in the final verse of this prayer. As Jesus is about to say amen, this is the high priestly prayer in John 17. In chapter 18, that's when it all comes unraveled. He'll be arrested. He'll be betrayed by Judas. He'll be crucified. He'll be buried. And praise God, we know the end. Praise God, he rises again from the grave. And we celebrate that. But here in this prayer, he is finalizing it. And before he says amen, he gives his disciples, those in the room, their purpose and their priorities so that as a disciple of Jesus Christ in that role that you and I might be in, in that role, we know clearly what our priority and our purpose is from Christ himself. And we must, as disciples, fight to make sure that our focus remains on the right priority as we follow Jesus Christ with our lives. Which brings us to our big idea this morning. The big idea is simply a sermon in a sentence. What is this summarized as? And how, when we look at this passage, and that is this, is that the focus of Christ's work is making God's name known. The big idea, the sermon in a sentence, is simply that the focus of Christ's work is making God's name known. Look at verse 26 again, if you would. It says this, I have made known to them your name. He's speaking to his father, praying to his father. And I will continue to make it known. Notice his focus, his priority. That the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. As Christ ends this prayer, his focus is on his work. The work that he's already done, I have made known to them your name. And then the focus is on the work he will continue to do. And I will make your name known in the future. And the question is this, how does Christ make God's name known? How does he do that? How does he work? What is his plan to make God's name known? And how is it my priority in my life? And some of you are sitting there saying, hey, Pastor Steve, I appreciate you telling me what God's priority is, but man, I got a busy life. I got a lot of things going on. I'm not sure if I agree with you that this might be the priority. Well, you buckle your seatbelt, you hang on for about 35, 45. No, it'd be shorter than that. And we'll see how what the word of God has to say to us to help us understand how as a disciple of Jesus Christ, what Christ is focused on should be what we're 
focused on. We see here this morning, to answer the question, how does Christ make God's name known? We see, number one, that God's name is known personally to the early disciples. This point is literal in the passage here. It's named personally. He says in verse 26, I have made known. When Christ says that he has made known, what he's saying is that I have revealed something to these men they would not otherwise know. He has revealed to them something divine, something supernatural that they can't find on Google, they can't find in a book. Only Christ himself could have divinely, supernaturally revealed. Matter of fact, if you study the original language, it actually is defined as that, is that this word made known means it is something that is known only through the supernatural. It cannot be naturally known as humans. We are limited to know this knowledge. And that's why it's important that we see what it says here. It says, I have made known. Christ has made it known. And you know what it reminds me of, beloved? It reminds me of the authority that Christ has. That Christ Christ did not ask permission. He did not have to have some support. He did not have to have a sidekick along with him. That Christ and Christ alone has the authority and the sovereignty to do what he wants and to make known God's name to whom he wants to make God's name known to. And we must be reminded this morning that it is Christ who has all authority, that Christ is God. He is God in the flesh, and as God, he has the right and sovereignty to do as he pleases. He has made known to them, to these 11, and when he says them, that word there in the verse, I have made known to them, in the prayer, he sort of bounces back and forth sometimes, because the prayer is for the original disciples, and it's for all disciples. And so we have to determine and discern when we see them, which them is he talking about? Well, literally, when he says, I have made it known to them, he's not talking about you. He's talking about the 11 guys in the room right there in that initial context. He's saying to his father, Father, there's 11 guys behind me. There was 12. Judas is, we'll see him in a little bit in chapter 18. 11 guys behind me. He says, Father, I have made known to them your name. Now, we see first that Christ, we see the authority of Christ and the sovereignty of Christ and the fact that Christ has made known to them he has the ability to reveal the supernatural and the divine to man. But I also want you to see that when Christ says, I've made it known to them, we see the grace of Christ displayed. Why? Because you know these 11 guys. Well, at least we're gonna get to know them here. In the next chapter, these same 11 guys that, are, that were uh, following Christ and, and watching the miracles happen and were close to Christ, guess what happens? They all scatter. They're all fearful. Some even deny him. Peter, three times, curse his name. Thomas doubts him and says, I'm not believing anything until I can put my finger in his palm. These same 11 guys who Christ sovereignly, graciously allowed them to know something about God they would not otherwise know, these guys that forsook him, that would betray him, Christ already knew they were gonna do that, and yet he still graciously allowed them to know something and, and be blessed uh, and to know the knowledge of God. And here's the thing that encourages me this morning is this, is that no matter where I am or where you are in your life, some of you think, well, man, I'm just not the Christian I need to be. and I'm just not doing the, the best that I can be. And I'm just, man, really struggling and failing. And I'm trying to be better. And I keep failing. I'm just no good. God must not uh, want to bless me. Listen, he let, he, he poured the blessing on the 11 guys who would forsake him and, and doubt him and run away from him and be fearful. And so if he'll bless them, man, beloved, hey, you're not as bad as Peter. You're not as bad as Thomas. You're not as bad as some of these guys. Listen, you say, I know, but man, I'll tell you, I didn't even want to come this morning, but you're here. Yeah, I know, but I didn't feel like coming. Well, you're here. And I, you know, sometimes I fail. Listen, beloved, understand this. Christ knows you. And he is not put on you this standard that you must be perfect in order for him to bless you. Christ does not bless you because of what you do. He blesses you because he is glorious and he is sovereign and he is good and he wants to work in your life so that you will give him glory and praise. You don't have to earn blessings from God. God decides who he blesses. He, he pours his blessings on the just 
and the unjust. And this morning, I don't know about you, but I just get a little excited here because I know sometimes in my own life, I can fail. I can, I can give up. I can be discouraged. I can feel like I'm not making progress. I can feel like I'm not making uh, things happen. I can feel like, oh, I messed up again and I was unfaithful again and I said the thing again and I messed up here again and I disobeyed God again and I, and I, and I fell on my face again. And you know, I just want to encourage you that even though you may feel that you're failing and tripping and overwhelmed with life and not being where you need to be, Christ can still be gracious to you and he will still bless you and help you and encourage you. So I encourage you wherever you are, if you trip, get back up. Can I just say this? And this is not like to puff you up, okay? All right? We don't do that, okay? But I will say, I will say this. This encouraged me one time when I heard this. You might be a better Christian than you think you are, okay? And sometimes we sort of beat ourselves up a little bit. And I think sometimes just being faithful as you can be and taking the next step and just following Christ, and sometimes it may be difficult, and sometimes you may have little faith and big faith, and sometimes you may want to follow Christ, and sometimes you're like, man, the last place I want to be right now is church, but you get up and you come and you drive and, you, and you're here and you sit here, and maybe you fall asleep, it's okay, you're here. Right? Can I just encourage you the way Christ encourages these men? He's like, I, Father, I let them know. Yeah, I know. It's almost like, I know. I know what they're going to do. But we're going to be gracious to them anyway. We see here, the, we see the authority of Christ. We see the grace of Christ. He says, I have made known to them, and here's the phrase, your name. Now, this takes a little bit of digging, all right? Okay, all right, you ready? We're going to dig a little bit here now, okay? We're going to study the Bible. That's why we have the Bible. We have church and Bible. It's going to be great. He says, your name. Now, here's the thing. Practically, most of them already knew God's name. There are Hebrews, okay? They're Jews. And so they probably went to synagogue and they went to school, or at least their parents did, and they went. And, and they probably knew the name of God. So when Christ is saying here, Father, I have made known to them your name, it's almost as if he's saying, I made known to them something they already knew. But that's not what he's saying. When he says your name, what he's declaring is, is that Christ, because they know Christ, Christ is the full embodiment of God's names. There is not one name of God that does not connect back to Christ. Any name of God you can think of, Christ fulfills that name. And so what he's saying is, I have made known to them you because they know me. And because they know me, they know you. Because I am you, and we are one. And so because they know me, you following, okay? I'm trying to go, okay? And because they know me, now they know you. I have made known to them your name. And there is a hundred names that we could uh, spout off this morning. I'll only share with you 97 of them here this morning. Just joking. Just joking. Some of you are like, yeah, that's fine. Great. I was waiting for the, yeah, come on, pastor. And all 97. I have seven of them. Is that okay? Can we compromise at seven of them? And as we think about this, and this is where it breaks down here, understand this, that Christ is the fulfillment. And the reason why we're taking time to walk through this, number one, it's the next verse, and we're walking through what the next verse says, but also because, listen, let me just side note here, also because when you come to God's house and the word of God is opened, you need to like be overwhelmed by the glory of Christ. That is the great motivator. We could, we could have self-help and we could have motivational speaks and we could say, here's four ways to a better life. Let me tell you one of the ways that you are going to change your life is when you see the glory of Christ. When you see how beautiful and how awesome and how holy he is, you will not help yourself. As Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Then I said, woe is me. And what we need and the reason why we're walking through this is to get a clear glimpse of who we sing about and who we talk about and who we believe in, that Christ is the full embodiment of God and the names of God. We think about the name Yahweh, Jehovah, which is probably one of the names that most of the disciples knew. That the this is the covenant name of God, often referred to as Lord in English. And Christ fulfilled that in John chapter 8 and verse 58, where he says, as Abraham was, I am. 
You see, when, when Moses sat at that bush and he said, who shall I say send me? And God said, you tell him, I am that I am sent you. That's the name of God. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. Christ fulfilled that name in John chapter 8 and verse 58. So when, I, when they see Christ, they see Yahweh. They see the Lord. We think about the name Elohim. Uh, it's a generic term for God, often used in context with the power and majesty of God. It was fulfilled in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9 where it talks about how all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ. Christ is Elohim. We think about Adonai, meaning Lord. Christ fulfilled that when he he was declared the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in Philippians chapter two and verse number 11. We think about the name El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. Christ fulfilled that name when he demonstrated that in Hebrews chapter one and verse three, where God says unto the son, he says, thy throne, O God is forever and ever. We think about the name Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Christ fulfilled that when he provided healing and he provided forgiveness for all uh, sinners in 1 Peter chapter 2 and Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. We think of the name Jehovah Rapha. The Lord will heal. Christ fulfilled that when Jesus performed many healings during his ministry and provided spiritual healing through his atoning sacrifice. We think about the name Jehovah Nisi which means the Lord is my banner. Christ fulfilled that name when Jesus is the one who gives victory over sin and death. We think about the name Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. And Christ fulfilled that name when he was pronounced the Prince of Peace. We think of the name Jehovah Rophi, which means the Lord is my shepherd. And Christ fulfilled that when he declared himself to be the good shepherd. We think of the name Jehovah Shema, which means the Lord is there. And Christ fulfilled that because he promises to never leave us or forsake us. Understand when Christ is saying to these men, hey, I've told them your name. They know who you are. They know me. And so therefore they know the full expression of God in me because I am God. Yeah. Understand this. Understand what Christ is saying here. You see, if we know Christ, then we know God. And we must understand and apply this in our lives in a way that sometimes we don't like to apply it. Because some, sometimes we can find out one of God's names and then we can start praying, Lord, you're Jehovah Jireh. You're the Lord who will provide. So Lord, provide for me and raise at work and provide for me a new car, provide for me a companion for life who has a good job and can take care of me and all these different things. Provide for me and good looking, Lord, okay? Some of you single folks out there, right? And Lord, good looking, okay? And, and whatever. And um, Lord, provide for me. And here's the thing. What happens is God doesn't provide that for whatever reason, and we get mad. Lord, I thought you were Jehovah Jireh. Can I say this? I don't know what God hasn't provided for you, but I know that God has already provided for you in Christ. That if, that if he doesn't give you one other thing, he has fulfilled his name. He is the God who provides. And we must understand that everything that God is, every name that he is, has been fully given, fully expressed, and fully embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you don't have peace this morning. Maybe you don't have all that you need. Maybe you don't feel like you're a sheep that's being cared for by a shepherd. That doesn't mean God has not fulfilled his name. Because if he gave us Christ that's more than all eternity could hold for what God has done for us. We must not make our Christianity materialistic. We must not bring God down to our level and say, well, if God comes through for me, then I will praise him. Listen, you can be broke, you can be you can be single, nothing wrong with being single, by the way, right? You can be broke, you can have no, no companion, you can have a car that doesn't have any gas in it, you can have a fridge that is empty, you can have a boss that brings you nothing but stress, you can have a marriage that's barely hanging on, you can, you can have all kinds of things in your life and you can still declare yourself to be blessed because God has provided you Christ. And it's nice to have those things as well, all right, okay? I'm not, listen, if that's you, you come talk to me afterwards. We'll take you to lunch, all right? Okay, we'll try to encourage you a little bit practically, okay? All right, try to help you out, okay? But what I'm, I think you understand what we're trying to say here. We're trying to, we're trying to understand that when Jesus says, I've, I've made known to them your name, it's almost as if he's saying that's all they need to know. 
They need to know me, and I am enough. I am sufficient. We see, how does God provide for us? How do, how does he know, how do we know his name? We see that God, God's name is known personally to the early disciples. And because God's name is known personally to them, it, it has some implications for us. It reminds me that Christ has all authority. It shows me that Christ gives grace to anyone, and I'm thankful for that. And it makes me accountable knowing the truth about Christ. You see, once these men knew who Christ really was, they were accountable now. And the question was, what were they gonna do with that knowledge? And that's where we see Christ's plan, number two, where God, God's name is known strategically to future disciples. Notice the phrase here, it says, and I will continue. So Christ says, I have made known to them my name, the full embodiment of God, but, but I also, I will continue to make my name known. The problem with that, though, is that Christ is going to ascend back to heaven in, in, in not, not too long from this passage. He's not going to be on earth anymore. So how will his name continue to be known if he's not here on earth making it known? We see, not on the screen, but I'll read in verse 20 of, God's, of his Christ's prayer. It says this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me, who will believe in me through their word. So now we start to see our purpose as disciples. Because we know who Christ is and because we have received the truth of Christ, like we know about Christ. These 11 knew about Christ. Now Christ says that more people will know about God's name because these people who know will tell the other people who don't know. The people in the room will tell the people outside the room. And we are here today and you are a disciple today because the people in the room on that day took seriously Christ's work to tell the people outside the room who told more people, who told more people, who told more people, who told your grandmother, who told your uncle, who told your friend, who told you, and now you're here. You see how that works? Okay? So now Christ says, this is not gonna stop. It's gonna continue because my disciples who know the truth about me will not be able to contain themselves and they'll share with everybody about me. The problem is, is that sometimes the wrong thing demands our attention. And we get so caught up in everything else that we have to do that we forget our true purpose for which Christ has given to us. We see, he says, I have made known to them and I will continue through their word, verse 20. It's sort of like when I do the dishes with my wife. I try to do the dishes. I've been married to my wife for 20 years. I try to do the dishes and apparently they're not up to her standard of cleanliness, right? Okay, how do you know that? She tells me, all right, okay. She'll say, move out of the way, move out of the way, all right? I'll do them. So I, we've tried to find a compromise here, right, with our, with our dish duty. And so she washes the dishes, and then every now and then, I can't say every time, every now and then, all right, when I'm feeling husbandy, all right, okay, right, I'll get up and I'll say, hey, you need any help with the dishes? And she'll say, yeah, you dry. And so we got, a, we got a team going here, right? So she washes them, gets them all clean, and then she hands them to me, and I, I dry them off and then put them in the dishwasher. I'll never understand uh, why you have to clean dishes before you put them in the dishwasher, but apparently that's what you have to do. I, 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 every time we talk, I'm like, can't we just put the dishes in the dishwasher? Isn't this why this exists, right? I feel like we're doing it twice. Oh, you can't get that done. She'll explain. And then I, I, sometimes I listen. But then I'll get back to my job. And so she'll, she'll wash the dishes. I dry the dishes. I put the dishes in the dishwasher. And we wash them again. Either way, it's a team. Here's the thing. She starts the work. I continue the work. Right? I got a part. See, I got a part. I don't do the dishwashing. I'm not really that good at it. All right, I'm getting better. But I have a part. And all God has asked me to do is focus on my part. All my wife has asked me to do is focus on my part. And that's as a disciple of Jesus Christ, all God is asking you to do when he says the work will continue is for you to focus on your part. Here's the thing. Sometimes when we hear a message about sharing Christ with the, with, uh, the world, we sort of take two extremes, right? 
One extreme is like we go out and we get a microphone and a karaoke machine and we stand on a corner and we get a sandwich board sign and we're like, honk, if you know Jesus, you know what I mean? And we street preach, that's one extreme. The other extreme is like, we don't do like anything at all, right? We're like, yeah, yeah, that's really good, but you do that, pastor. Like, I'm not gonna do that. Listen, let me say this right now. God is not asking you to become a pastor and God is not asking you to stay completely silent. What he's asking you is just to do your part. You see, fulfilling Christ's mission and continuing his work is just doing your part. Now, you say, what's my part? If our God is sovereign and if he is, has all authority, then your life is no accident. Your story is no accident. So that when you walk into work tomorrow, instead of just looking at the job you had to get, you look at it as the job that God strategically placed you in. Because in that workplace, God knew that you were the best person to tell the people who don't know that you know. See, it changes it. We no longer clock in and clock out. We no longer just stop by the restaurant. We no longer just say hi to the neighbor. Now we look at our lives that we have been strategically placed by God to do our part, to share Christ to invite my neighbor to church. And maybe you don't know everything about the gospel and about church, that's okay. Just like I don't know everything about how to fix a broken arm. If you broke your arm right now, I don't know anyone in this room that can fix it, okay? If you're a doctor, you do that, you let us know, all right? But none of us in this room know how to fix a broken arm. But all of us in this room know a place where a broken arm can be fixed. And we will do everything we can to get them there. Listen, you may not know everything about God and about the Bible and about Christ and about the gospel, but you know a place where they teach the Bible, they talk about Christ, and you do your part by just getting people here. And, this, and, and we understand that we do that because we know that there are people who don't know and Christ has called us to do our part through their word. We do the part. And when we continue to do Christ's work, how it impacts our lives is this. It gives us, it gives every disciple a clear purpose. Your purpose, here's your purpose. Your purpose as a disciple is to, number one, first, become a disciple. That's number one, okay? That means you have to believe on Christ for salvation. Number two is to follow him in believer's baptism, at, to be scripturally baptized. That's a command from Christ. And if you're not scripturally baptized, oh, I would love to talk to you, all right? Because in a couple weeks, we have, a, we have baptism Sunday, and that is your next step. You say, well, I'm gonna try this or try this. You can't do step five, you don't do step two. And the Bible teaches scriptural baptism as immersion in the water, under the water, out of the water, after salvation. That's your, that's your step. So you become a disciple, you get baptized, and then number three, here it is, you grow as a disciple. So now you're like, okay, I'm a disciple, and I, got, I was in the baptistry, I'm good, now what? You just keep coming. You say, I just come to church? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be some, it come, somewhat repetitive, right, okay? Sunday happens every week. It's amazing. It comes every, every seven days. Sunday's there. It's amazing. It's like God knew what he was doing. And every seven days, you come and you sit right here and you learn. You open the word of God and you just learn. And some of you are in different places right now, okay? Some of you are in different places right now. Some of you know a lot. Some of you know a little. Some of you need to just keep growing. Can I encourage you? Just keep coming. Just keep coming. Because the word will do its work. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It is so critical to your life to be here. And I wish I wasn't the pastor. I wish someone else was saying this so that I wouldn't feel self-serving. We are not trying to get full rooms. We're trying to grow disciples. And so you have to be and grow and come. And here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna learn and you're gonna grow. And you're gonna find like, wow, I didn't know that. And like, next thing you know, like you're gonna be out at work and someone's gonna like do something that usually you would like flip your lid on. And then you find yourself like being nice. You're like, wow, how come I'm so nice right now? Oh, because you learned over and over again, you gotta be like Christ, gotta be like Christ. And next thing you know, you're gonna be like, man, I'm really mad at that guy, but I'm not gonna tell him because I wanna be like Christ and be testimony. So you're growing, you're growing. This is good. This is good. You're growing. And then what's gonna happen is this. You're gonna grow to the point where you're gonna be confident enough to help other people become disciples. And then you find yourself sharing your faith, inviting your friend to church, not because the pastor is twisting your arm, because you're like, man, it's changing my life. And I can't help but tell you about it. This is why here at Heritage, we don't program evangelism. We don't have an evangelism program. 
Why? Because we believe that if Christ is transforming your life, you won't be able to help but tell other people about it. And so this is why, as Christ is working in you, you, you know why? You know why these men changed the world? Because they spent time with Christ. And they began to talk about him. We can't help but tell him. The Bible says that in Acts. We'll get to Acts one of these days and go through it verse by verse. But the Bible says that, the Bible says like that they were arrested and they were stoned, like to the point of death. And they're like, don't talk about Christ anymore. And they let him out of jail. And the first thing they did was went and talked about Christ. And they were like, we can't help but talk about him. And this is what Christ wants to do. He wants to grow you to the place or you can't help talk about what Christ is doing and he is changing you so much that people can't help but notice that you're not the same person. And that's when you can do your part to continue Christ's work. Why? Because when we continue Christ's work, it helps me prioritize what really matters. You see, the Bible says in Colossians, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. You see, at the end of this day, this life will be over. Becky mentioned we had a beautiful celebration of life this past Friday, and there was probably 300 or so people in the room standing for more than two hours listening to people talk about this woman's life. And in that moment, it didn't matter what car she drove. It didn't matter how, where her house was. It didn't matter. None of that mattered. What mattered was how did her life impact other people's lives. And we must understand that Christ is calling us who are in the room to be focused and prioritized to tell the people who are not in the room about how he's changing us and how he's growing us and how he's helping us so that they can find the same hope and help that you and I need. Why? Because when we, when we continue Christ's work, it changes the way I see people. It's no longer the waitress. It's no longer the neighbor. It's no longer the barista. It's no, it's no longer just my child. It's someone who I can share Christ with. It's not just my spouse. It's a person I can share Christ with. And it changes the way. And so Christ says, hey, I'm focused on making God's name known. How did he do it? First to these guys. Then, strategically, those guys took it and shared it with everybody else. And here we are today. And then finally, we're done very quickly, is this. God's name is known affectionately to every disciple. You see, those who know Christ know his love. He says in the last part of verse 26, that the love which you have loved me, this is Christ. This is, Christ is saying this is the way that God loves him. And God loves his son, beloved, with a perfect love. It's a perfect love. He says that that love may be in them. You see, when I become a disciple of Jesus Christ, two things happen. I possess the perfect love of Christ in me. It dwells in me. It's called the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And so through the Spirit, I, can, I possess perfect love. And that perfect love is what helps me to know that I am saved and I'm a Christian and I belong to Christ. But then not only do I possess God's perfect love through the Spirit, but also I can express God's perfect love to others. It, this word, when it says that it may be in them, it, it can translate in the Greek to among them, among them. You see, this is, this is the beauty of God's church. Can I just, yes, I will. And, and, and this is the beauty of God's church. You and I come in, maybe you're a disciple, maybe you're not. Maybe it's your first time in church, maybe it's been a long time, it doesn't matter. You're here, okay? We come in, and we become disciples, or we're already disciples, all right? And now we're gonna grow. And we're all still human, we're still sinners. So sometimes, even the people that are in my church, they sort of get on my nerves. Or they like, you know, they take my seat. Or they, you know, take my parking spot. And so it's, ah, right? And I'm trying to love them. As earlier in the prayer, remember we talked about unity, right? So we're trying to be unified. So we're trying to be unified. All right, all right, all right I forgive you, forgive you. Okay, we're good, all right, we're good, all right. You're fine, sorry, okay, it's good. Let's, let's stay unified. And then we're, we're keep, we keep growing together. And then what happens is this. Then we start focusing on the people out there. And then we try to show them God's love. And if I'm willing to show God's love out there, guess where I'm going to show God's love? In here. And so now, as a disciple, I possess God's love, and now I can express it. And now we are a unified 
love expressing people focused on sharing Christ with those that don't know. I think they call that, mm, what's that word? Oh, a church. I think that's what a church is. That imperfect people are growing together, expressing love to each other, focused on Christ's work, expressing love to them. And we just do that until the Lord calls us on. And this is the beauty of the church. You see, and he says in the last part, he says, and I in them. And that word in them, remember it says among them. See, here's the thing. That as Christ is calling you to do your part to share Christ, to invite someone to church, know this, you're not alone. Christ is with you. He will help you. It reminds me of my son, my son Miles. He just turned 10 on Thursday. And uh, every now and then, he's, af he's afraid of the dark. He's not in here right now, so he can't, he can't get mad at me. But he's afraid of the dark sometimes, as we all can be at times, right? Okay. And, and so sometimes he'll be up in his room, like by himself, he'll be super quiet in the house. And he'll just go, like this, he'll go, Dad? And I'll go, yeah, son. He'll go, oh, love you. Love you too. And he goes, oh, that's it. <laughs> right? And, and sometimes he gets a little scared. And so in that moment, he calls out to make sure his dad is still present. And the voice of his father comforts him. You see, this last part, the last words of this prayer should bring us incredible comfort. That as Christ calls us to do our part, hey, it could be a little scary, can't it? It could be a little scary to go up and to invite someone to church and they, they don't even think you're a Christian, right? You're like, hey, I'm a Christian. I probably don't, I'm not sure if I act like a Christian in front of you, but that's okay. That's for another time, all right? But hey, listen, you should come to my church, right? Okay? And it could be a little intimidating. Hey, why don't you come with me on Sunday to invite a friend or coworker? But here's the thing, here's the thing. When you get scared to do your part, just call out to your father. Lord, he'll go, I'm here. He says, I'll be with them. And as Christ calls us to grow and to share him with those that don't know, he promises to be with us. And if he is with us, I can be bold. If he's with us, then my fears are calm. Why? Because the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. If he's with us, then I'm never alone. If he's with me, then he'll help me to do what he's called me to do. Why? Because life has a way of stealing and demanding my attention. And if we're not careful, as disciples of Christ, we can put our attention on everything else but what Christ has called us to do. See, what has Christ called me to do? Make his name known. Make his name known to the people who don't know. Here at Heritage, you know this, we don't learn to learn, right? We learn to live. So how can we apply this message to our lives starting tomorrow or today? Number one question is this. Ask yourself this question. Do I have a personal relationship with God? If you don't, then the Bible teaches that you can have one. You can know Christ as your Savior today by simply calling upon Christ for salvation. The Spirit of God is speaking to you. You can know God personally and have a relationship with him. Number two, maybe you ask yourself this question, what are practical ways to continue Christ's work? And you know, honestly, sometimes continuing Christ's work and expressing God's name is simply in action sometimes. Like some of you need to be baptized. When you stand up there, you're publicly identifying Christ. That's continuing his work. So sometimes, watch this now, just tonight, when you go to say goodnight to your son or your daughter, that you would just maybe pray over them. That's expressing, that's continuing Christ's work because you're, you're sharing Christ with that, with that child. Maybe as a, a couple, you would share Christ together. Maybe this afternoon or this week, you would take some time and just pray or text someone a, a verse or something that would encourage them to know more about Christ. Or maybe there's a friend or a neighbor, which leads us to number three. Maybe there's someone you know that you're like, man, I need to invite them to church next week. It's a great opportunity. It's a good Sunday. And you know, I've been putting it off. I've been a little scared, but I know Christ is with me. He'll help me. And let me say this, even if they say no, even if they reject, even if they don't show up, that doesn't negate you from having to do your part. Because God doesn't say, if you do it, it'll, it'll always happen. He just says, go and share and make my name known and he'll do the rest. 
And so who is it in your life that you need to say, man, that person, they need to know about Christ. And maybe I can't tell them everything, but I, can, I know a place where they can learn. So I'm gonna invite them to church this week. And let's just continue to be a people that are, is growing in God's grace and sharing God's name. Why, why? Because the focus of Christ's work is making God's name known. And if that is his focus, for it to continue, it must be our focus. And may God give us grace that it will be. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time.